So good evening. Uh, my name is Charlotte McNamara and I'm the head of the health department at the Kennel Club. I'm really pleased that you've been able to join us this evening for our webinar relating to Breedwatch um, and veterinary health checks and as they are now um, and some light discussion on what may come in future. So as well as myself this evening, um, I'm very pleased to have with me several members of our Breed Standards and Confirmation subgroup of the Dog Health Group at the Kennel Club, including our chairman, um, Ian Seath, and also Dr. Alison Skipper, who's very involved with the veterinary health checks. So I will invite the members of the group to participate in our questions at the end of the session. Great, let's get started then. So what will we cover this evening? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about judging for health and prioritising health um, and the tools and resources that are available to you. Um, also, the Breedwatch system as it is now, um, a little bit of context and history about Breedwatch um, and also the points of concern and what they cover. Um, and as I mentioned, we're then going to look very lightly at the future developments, what we're working on at the moment, uh, the, pro the progress that we've been able to make um, and what is potentially to come next. And then also just a, a wider um, consideration of what is going on internationally um, and then also what resources internationally are available to those who are interested in the health and welfare of show dogs. So let's go on. Perfect. So I felt it was really important um, and the, the Kennel Club feels it's really important um, to really cover the introductory paragraph to all Bree standards at the start of our talk this evening. I think that because this has been in place for some time now, it would be very natural and very easy um, for this to be something that you maybe have seen several times, even if you're early in your judging career, definitely potentially if you are further on in your judging career. I think that potentially it's something that you may overlook or just be so used to seeing and not potentially pay as much attention to this um, as I feel we really, really need to now. I think that it's really, really important to highlight, um, and as you'll see on the screen, the areas that are in bold and the areas that really, really make it clear exactly what we all need to be thinking about when we are judging and even when we are exhibiting and potentially when we are breeding. Um, it does really, really clearly set out exactly what we need to do and what we need to avoid and exactly um, what features should be in the right measure. And I think it's really, really important for all judges at all levels of experience to revisit this. Think about it in the context of the breed that you're judging. Think about it in the context of your decision making and absolutely make this a priority. Okay. So moving on from that, particularly looking at judging for health and that within the breed appreciation days and within your breed specific training, the introductory paragraph should play a really key role. It is in the introductory paragraph for all breed standards and it's actually really, really useful for those that are really knowledgeable about the breed to put this in context uh, of their own breed for judges um, and especially aspiring judges of that breed. Again, within the breed appreciation days, it's hugely useful if the breed are able to put in context, in context the point of concerns and they're able to really cover exactly how to look for this and exactly how to assess those points as a judge for that breed. The mentors also will be able to potentially give real life examples. They'll be able to show you um, obviously good, good and potentially poor examples. And I think it's really, really important that this doesn't stay on paper and it's something that we actually talk about, discuss uh, and potentially uh, definitely early on in your career, that it's given a lot of focus and attention so that we make sure that we are judging for health. 
OK, so I'm just going to give a little bit of history about what is Breedwatch, because I understand that some people, hopefully not many, because it has been around for a long time. But I understand that some people may be sitting here and thinking, well, actually, I, I'm not even sure what Breedwatch is. So Breedwatch was a system set up in 2013, um, and this was the original model that was published for Breedwatch around this time, 2013, 2014. As you'll see in this model, we still use phrases like high profile breeds, um, which was a phrase that we used pre sort of 2013, 2012. That's how we allocated these breeds. And then we then brought in this naming of category three. Um, Breedwatch was brought in as an early warning system, ide ideally, to identify points, vis visible points of concern for individual breeds. Um, and information was gathered through health surveys, feedback from judges, dog health experts. And we did have a consultation with the breeds around this time and especially around between 2012 and 2013, there was quite a lot of consultation, particularly with the category three breeds. Um, we now have the breed health and conservation plans, which a lot of breed health coordinators and hopefully some breeders and exhibitors will be aware of. So a lot of our data sources and information have now been combined into the breed health and conservation plans. But the system we still have at the moment is obviously we have breed watch in place we have the three categories breeds that are in category one with no visible points of concern that we are monitoring at this stage but there's still an option for judges to report any emerging conditions for those breeds we have category two which, which are breeds with breed watch points of concern listed um, and the the reporting of those for those breeds is mandatory and then we have the previously named high profile breeds, which we don't really um, use that terminology anymore. Um, but the category three breeds that obviously have significantly more points of concern um, and we work much more closely with those breeds in a number of areas. So what do the points of concern for breeds cover? Um, I'm going to say at this point, I'm not a vet, so I'm not going to um, go into a huge amount of depth. Um, I also think it's important that we do actually, we will mention this throughout the presentation this evening, that it really, really helps for to go to the breed experts and to the breed clubs because they do have some really, really valuable resources to help with these areas. Um, but I will give you an overview of what they cover and obviously we can answer some questions we do have Alice and other vets with us this evening so they cover everything that you as a judge should be able to assess when you're judging in the ring so eyes skin and wrinkling mouth and dentition weight and body condition nose and nostrils breathing limbs and movement tails and coat and husbandry so we're just going to go through briefly what the points of concern are um, across breeds, but they're just in these general categories. So for eyes, now I've used the images here today from the illustrated guide, but uh, I know Sheila Crispin, particularly Professor Sheila Crispin and others have provided some fantastic images. I know also that there are breed communities that have developed some really in-depth look um, and some resources that will really help people um, within the context of their own breed. But just thinking about what we are asking judges to be aware of um, when it comes to eyes, we really want the, you to note and avoid um, dogs that show excessive amounts of loose facial skin uh, with conformational defects of the upper and or lower eyelids so the eyelid margins are not in normal contact with the eye when the dog is in its natural pose they turn in or out or both abnormalities are present so that's quite a lot to to take in and again I go back to the point that it's really important where you can get the opportunity to speak to people within the breed but also to read the resources that we have available and the additional materials to really understand how we can best assess for this. We also ask for you to look out for excessively prominent eyes 
sore eyes due to damage or poor eyelid conformation or incomplete blink. And those are the points that are listed for several breeds. We've also given a description here of entropian and ectropian. And as I said, it's really worth going away and looking at these things in more depth. So skin and wrinkling, again, just some examples here from our illustrated guide, which I will mention later because it's actually now freely available on the Kennel Club website in a digital copy. So we ask when it comes to skin and wrinkling that we look for signs of dermatitis in the skin fold. You'll see in this image there that there's a reddening, a wetness, um, hair loss or scarring from previous dermatitis, excessive nasal folds. So again, there's a, an example with a pug below here where the nasal fold is, is covering the nose, excessive amounts of loose facial skin, and that's listed for a number of breeds as well. So again, really worth looking at the breed specific um, information on this. Mouth and dentition, again, just some examples from our illustrated guide. Um, incorrect bite is listed for a number of breeds and it is really worth looking um, at the breed expert advice and also with the breed appreciation days or any hands on experience that you can get really speaking to experts within that breed about what's correct for the breed and obviously being aware of anything that's incorrect and also could cause a health or welfare problem. Body condition, again, listed for a number of breeds, both for significantly overweight and significantly underweight. So here is a body condition score developed by the pug breed um, with the University of Cambridge. The University of Cambridge created this resource with them um, as part of their ongoing BOAS research group. There is also a very useful Purina um, body condition scoring chart, which is more the generic um, dog outline. Um, this is obviously a, a topic that's very subjective to the breed and obviously there's different opinions, but this is something that has to be managed and we have to start to really question and assess our own decision making and really discuss and assess this and consider this within breed communities. Obviously, any dogs that are significantly overweight or are underweight, there will be a significant quality of life impact to those dogs. And that needs to be considered when we're rewarding dogs in the show ring. It's something that we could hopefully as a community change and hopefully Breedwatch and the monitoring of this within Breedwatch will enable that to happen. I know that there's breeds that also have developed um, really good breed specific guidance in this area. So nostrils and nose. So here, um, this, these images were actually illustrated from the French Bulldog, but actually this does apply to any breed. Um, so it should be taken into account when you're breeding any breed, particularly um, a brachycephalic breed. So obviously we have a sliding scale from our open nostrils, which we say are acceptable and ideal, right up to our severe stenosis, which we say is not acceptable and it must be penalised. And it really is trying to ensure that we move right down to the other end of the spectrum, the ideal end of the spectrum, and really try to remove dogs being placed or rewarded that have the, the more severe uh, examples. Breathing. Um, thankfully, an area that I think we've seen quite a lot of improvement in um, and especially obviously to the breeds that are involved, their engagement um, with the Cambridge BOAS group in this area. And that's definitely showing um, within the show community. Um, the illustration here is a visual of an airway provided by the University of Cambridge, and it just shows you exactly what's going on behind um, behind the nose and exactly what's going on where we can't see. But obviously, dogs showing dis respiratory 
distress, including difficulty breathing or laboured breathing, dog showing respiratory noise, need to be penalised and judges need to use the tools available to them. The, the breathing and the airway can be stressed during exercise. So if you are able to move dogs uh, another, another lap around the ring, if you're able to move a dog that you're not quite sure about, you feel like potentially there's some respiratory noise there um, and you want to understand exactly um, if there is an issue with that dog, use the tools available to you as a judge within, and that's within our breed watch guidance. So make sure that you can exercise the dogs to a level that you're comfortable with, and then obviously penalize any dogs that are making any level of respiratory noise. Limbs and movement, again, an area that really will benefit from you understanding within the context of the individual breeds, what's appropriate, what's right. Um, but what we ask for within um, breed watch is that you, you look for cow hocks, excessive turn of sifal or weak hind quarters. You do see these that obviously do you do no, note them in your health monitoring and also you do penalise those dogs accordingly. Um, here we've just got a very basic illustration that shows normal conformation and then one that shows obviously how cow hocks may look. I can't stress it enough. Um, movement particularly is, is so subjective to breeds. We want dogs to be dogs first and we want them to move soundly, but you will really benefit from understanding um, and being able to see live examples of dogs with experienced people in that breed, part of potentially breed, breed appreciation days and a part of your ongoing education within that breed. Tails, this is one specific to a number of breeds um, and it is really associated with brachycephalic breed conformation so we just uh, the points that we list are the lack of tail so no tail present whatsoever um, which is obviously not ideal at all and it can be associated with other problems so it must be penalized and also screw tails um, so here we've just got an illustration of a screw tail and, and that uh, turning to the side. Thankfully, um, particularly the bulldog community have done a huge amount of work in this area and really improved the tail conformation of those breeds. And they've actually been able to give really clear advice and guidance on what they want to see in the ring. Um, so again, it's another area and a resource that you could look at if you are interested in those breeds. OK, we're going to move away from the points of concern now um, and we're going to just look at how we actually complete the health monitoring forms and what's available. So if you are judging a category two or three breed, you must complete the online form. Um, this used to be a paper form many years ago. I, I can remember um, myself and a colleague sending out these forms, but we have no paper forms um, for category two and three breeds anymore. It's online. It's much simpler and much easier for you com to complete. We provided the link here. We can also provide that to anybody who wants to and who needs that afterwards. Um, and obviously, please do complete that because it is mandatory and it's got to be completed if we're if we're able to collect the data that we want to. Optional forms, which our paper forms are found in the back of judging books. They are only for category one breeds and they should be used if you see a new or emerging concern uh, during your judging appointment. Please don't feel like you have to complete those optional forms. Sometimes people complete them and they say really, really lovely things about their entry and are, and are really, really complimentary about the health of the breed and the entry. And that's lovely to hear, um, but we actually don't need to collect it for that purpose so please complete those optional forms if you think there's something new or emerging in a category one breed that's not currently recorded under the breed watch system so just to really summarize our, our judging for health checklist within breed watch and what we recommend um, as an ideal run through um, before judging appointments so understanding which category the breed you you are judging is in 
Um, obviously, we can provide that on the Kennel Club website, but please don't leave this until you're actually there on the day um, or the night before. Please take the time to understand which category, category they're in and actually understand what that breed community are doing and what resources they've developed to try to address these points. Understand the regulations that apply when judging, specifically those that relate to health. Really understand the tools that are, are in your disposal, what you can do as a judge if you are uncomfortable with the health and welfare of certain dogs when you are judging. What you can do and how to follow the correct procedure is really, really important and crucial. So, Refer to Breed Club websites, as I've said, for further judges' education and guidance on specific points of concern, including considering attending those breed appreciation days and further education in those specific breeds, where health should always be a priority and always be included. Look at the Breedwatch Illustrated Guide for further guidance on specific points of concern. As I've said, this is available on the Kennel Club website and we're happy to provide anybody with further information on that. Review the breed standard, including the introductory paragraph and really think about how you can enact and enable that introductory paragraph when you are judging. And use the mechanisms available to judges when needed, including the ability to ask exhibitors to withdraw or withholding awards. And then finally, once you've completed your appointment for, man for the category two and three breeds, please complete the mandatory form and make this as accurate and as honest as possible so we can really help to address those issues. So we're going to move on and I'm just going to give you a very brief outline and then obviously I welcome the members of our subgroup of the Dog Health Group to actually give you a little bit more information or answer any questions that may arise. So we began a review of Breedwatch um, last year um, as it was coming into its 10th year since 2013. And I'm pleased to say that we are continuing that review and there will be a new system that will be implemented moving forward. So what's included and what's being considered within that review? So we're looking at what veterinary health checks are required before and during shows and what kennel club guidance and training is required for vets involved in undertaking those veterinary health checks. What educational materials are needed to support judges and exhibitors more effectively? What more can the Kennel Club do really uh, to enhance and evolve what we already offer? What training would enable judges to better recognise breed specific health concerns? So again, what can we offer educationally, whether that be digitally or online with webinars or face to face training? What more can we do? And then how the Kennel Club receives health information from judges to improve upon existing reporting and monitoring process. We're aware that we used to have a system where it we, we much more effectively were able to chase for reports from judges. So we want to relook at this now that our custom management system at the Kennel Club has bedded in slightly and we're able to actually reassess what processes we could put in place to improve that monitoring um, and enable some feedback to the breeds. How can the Kennel Club better how can the Kennel Club provide better support to breed clubs, judges and exhibitors with access to health data from shows? Exactly what I have just said. We want to be able to get that reporting in really effectively, make sure we maximise the amount of reports we receive from judges and then be able to feed that data back to the breed so that they have that and they understand um, what judges are reporting for their breed. And then also look at how the Kennel Club highlights dog showing as a positive lever for change when considering health and welfare. And I think that's a priority for all of us, especially if you have joined this call this evening. So what's the time frame um, that we're working to at the moment? So we're currently in the um, internal phase of managing the working groups and working through each topic in detail and assessing exactly where we are at the moment. So that's January to April. In April, May, our intention is to finalise the new policies, processes and procedures and finalise whatever the, the new system for Breedwatch and Veterinary Health Checks may look like. We then have got some dates 
um, which if you are a category two or three breed, you will have received um, an invitation via the breed health coordinator. So we have Wednesday the 17th of May, which will be at Stoneley, and Wednesday the 31st of May, which will be at Clarges Street. And we really welcome breeds uh, to come along, give us their views and their feedback, and actually to discuss this area with us. Following this, our final report um, will go to the Kennel Club Board, hopefully in July. And then the intention is from July to January 2014 to have a planning and implementation of this new system. So really understanding exactly what we need to do to put a really effective system in place for Breedwatch and taking on, view, on board the views of the committee and the working group members and also obviously from those breed engagement sessions and then hopefully the plan is to have something to launch and some the new system in place for January 2024. So just to to really stress um, why we are we are here Obviously, the Kennel Club has been working um, with this system for over 10 years. Um, we work very closely um, with the high profile breeds, particularly from 2012 onwards. And before that, there are a number of committees at the Kennel Club dedicated to dog health and welfare um, and the particular areas of concern. However, it would be remiss of me to not mention the growing pressure internationally on dog showing, um, particularly on health and welfare and particularly for certain breeds and it is really really important now more than ever that we understand that it is possible that legislation could impact dog showing both here and in internationally um, and we really really must demonstrate our commitment to health and welfare and demonstrate that this is at the heart of what we do it's at the heart of this hobby and actually that you put the best ambassadors of these breeds forward and they show what a positive lever that dog showing can be for change um, in these breeds. So it's really, really crucial that we all consider this now. Um, and I hope that we can really positively embrace any changes that we make to breed watch and build the system as it will be moving forward together. So I've just listed some resources and information. Obviously, everybody here this evening will receive um, this webinar content. So you'll be able to look at this more directly. Um, we, we have a very good relationship with the SKK and obviously they have the BSI in Sweden. So it is worth comparing and looking um, again with the Nordic countries and also the International Partnership for Dogs have some really useful information and guidance for judges. As well, obviously, there is a multitude of valuable resources I've mentioned throughout on breed clubs. And I'd really, really recommend going directly to those breeds if you're interested in judging those breeds and taking the time to understand um, that they're opinion and their views on breed watch and the points of concern. So I'm going to thankfully stop sharing my screen, welcome the other um, members in now. So um, if you bear with me for two moments, I'll stop sharing. You should be able to see the members of the subgroup. And I think we'll just go to some questions. So if you do have a question, please do type the question in the Q&A area. Um, we have received some questions in advance, so we'll go to those straight away. Um, but please do, you won't be able to ask your question. So if you want to ask a question, please do type it in. So um, Ian Seath, I think I'll come to you first as chairman of the Breed Standards and Confirmation subgroup. One of the questions that we received in advance of our session this evening was what impact we think Breed Watch has had. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to take that and invite other members of the group to join you. Thanks, Charlotte. And uh, as chairman of the Breed Standards and Confirmation subgroup, can I thank uh, Charlotte and her colleagues for the hard work that they put into designing this, the number of iterations that we've gone through to put the presentation together. And uh, I know making the technology work can be a bit of a challenge for some of us as well. So well done to the, the, the Kennel Club Health team for, for that. Uh, just to pick up, uh, there were a number of questions that we had submitted ahead of the webinar about what's the evidence that breed watch has made a difference and 
obviously we've been collecting data since it started and breed standards and confirmation subgroup meetings uh, always looked at the data. We had those summarized and presented to us by uh, the staff from the from the health team. I think if you, if you start to drill into some of that data, it's pretty clear that judges are reporting positive changes in some of the breeds. So if I take my own breed, which is Dachshunds, one of the concerns that we had in the very early days was dogs that were perhaps uh, underweight or undernourished. We're just not seeing those reports coming through. So I know it might be a bit anecdotal just to be reporting subjective feedback like that, but that's that's certainly one of the examples. And Alison, I know you've been talking with, if I can hand over to Alison, talking with, um, I think, Jane Ladlow about the experience in, in the Bulldogs and some of the evidence that we have around the impact that we've had on health and welfare of Bulldogs. Alison, would you like to pick up on that? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, Jane Ladlow, who, who for those who don't know, is the vet at the University of Cambridge, who's led the programme on BOAS research there. Um, and therefore has been attending um, brachycephalic dog shows, particularly bulldogs and some other key breeds for quite a long time now. Um, she is very positive, saying that she's really noticed a change both in the culture within the breed community um, and also in the appearance of the actual dogs that she's seeing over that time, um, which I've also heard reported from the breed community. And I've noticed myself, you know, at, at successive crafts that um, on average across the show population as a whole, um, bulldogs have less extreme conformation now, they have smaller nose rolls, they have more of a tail, and the respiratory noise that is considered acceptable among the breed community is very much less than it used to be. Um, so I think that's one instance of a breed where um, the breed watch and the breed community working together have really made a difference to the welfare of the dogs concerned. Thanks, Alison. Hector, I don't know whether do you want to make any observations around impact you've seen as another veterinary surgeon member of our team? I would just echo what you have said and Alison has just said. Uh, there is no doubt that um, the pressure that uh, has been uh, experienced in breeds to make sure that dogs are not experienced, uh, not expressing um, excessive uh, conformational features that are detrimental to their health in order to progress on to um, the higher levels of awards where they're needing to be ex examined with with breed um, uh, breed specific examinations appears to have trickled down as it were and, and changed I think it's widely accepted um, much of the uh, uh, the extreme conformation that we used to see in some some exhibits uh, such that um, there's been, I think, a fairly obvious improvement in a number of breeds. Sheila, Professor Sheila Crispin, I wonder whether you may have some observations around eyes that you're seeing and eye confirmation. Yes, unfortunately, as soon as you deal, you breed for a flat face, you, you tend to have quite important changes to the eyes and the lids, uh, one of which is the orbit is relatively shallow, so the eye is very prominent and very easily damaged. And people who have things like French bulldogs and bulldogs will tell you that eye problems like ulcers are very common in the breed. Add to that the fact that because you've got a prominent eye, uh, the point you know, you, you, you've got a, a double whammy, really, but it's got to be good. Thanks, Sheila. Um, I guess one of the other comments I'd make is that we do get feedback and requests from the breeds that come to the committee. So there are uh, there are people in the breed community, judges, people on breed health com committees, breed health coordinators who are sending us their views and their requests for changes to breed watch. And each of the meetings, we typically have one or two breeds that are asking for changes in terms of either additional features or mod modifications of existing points of concern. So really would encourage breed club communities and breed health coordinators, please continue to give us the feedback. All of those little points of concern really can make a difference. And Sh Charlotte talked about some of the history of this. Uh, if some of you may well remember the Bateson report back in 2009, Pro uh, Professor Bateson actually said that dog shows could be a significant force for good or a lever for good. We really have to make sure that we can demonstrate that. And Charlotte's slide about some of the headlines of what's going on on the continent 
we absolutely don't want to be in the same sort of position that maybe some of the shows and the exhibitors have found themselves in in uh, Austria and Germany over the last 12 months or so. Thank you, Charlotte. OK, so we had quite a, a large number of questions um, around uh, vet checks, just really, um, again, looking at the purpose and the process and some questions about whether they've been effective and then also some questions looking to the future about whether they would be extended. So I don't know if you want to just summarise um, on that area of vet checks. Let me pick it up just as chairman and sort of overview on that. There has been a lot of feedback clearly uh, around the vet check process and um, we are aware that there's been some inconsistencies in application and the work of the uh, the working party looking at this we are uh, modifying or we will be looking to modify the vet check process I think I'd like to hand over to the two vets who are more actively involved in this sorry Alison I keep bouncing stuff to you um, but we we had a, a working group meeting about a month ago where we've been through some of these issues and um, Alison can I just hand over to you to talk about some of the the principles that we're now looking at please. Sure so I think it's important because obviously not everybody um, listening to this webinar will be involved in a breed that has um, been involved in the vet check process. Um, the vet check process was originally introduced um, with the what are now category three breeds to check for clinical signs of disease associated with um, extreme confirmation. Um, and that has remained their purpose since, that the vet checks were only ever intended to look at features that the judge could reasonably expect to um, pick up during their own um, examination of the dog. Um, and uh, they are not intended to address matters that are not related to confirmation. Um, and we're not considering extending the veterinary checks within the um, show day to anything beyond matters related to confirmation because it is only the matters related to confirmation that the judge is interacting with if you if you see what I mean. Um, having said that, um, certainly as someone who's been doing the vet checks for a long time, um, the current wording within the guidance is quite confusing even for the vet, particularly if they're not accustomed to doing the checks because um, the exact criteria that are highlighted for different breeds is quite variable. So um, we're looking at streamlining that to make it more user friendly, uh, particularly for vets who aren't perhaps accustomed to doing it. Um, and rationalising some other elements of the process as well. Although I think it's important to stress that, you know, there is always going to be some degree of, of variation between people because, you know, to some extent, obviously, you are making a, 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 a judgment decision and vets like everybody else, human, and not all going to make exactly the same decision, just the same way as not every judge is going to make exactly the same decision decisions. So we can't iron out every variation, but we hope to make the process more transparent and straightforward. Hector, do you want to comment as you were part of the working group that's been looking at this vet process? I think as Alison has just been indicating, the important thing is that when there's an examination in which something may be passed or failed, there has to be a threshold. And uh, that's the reason why if different people are examining the same dog or the same dog is being examined on different days, there will always be some animals which um, a decision is made one way or the other that might upset people because it's not consistent. But um, the fact is you cannot be absolutely black and white when it's a judgment about the degree of an exaggeration or the degree of a problem. And that probably has led to a lot of um, uh, the disquiet with the system in the past and it's something we're looking at to try and see how better we can make things consistent um, certainly between those who are doing the examinations on the same occasion as it were but we can never rule out the change in a dog from one one time to another um, which can be a difference in its clinical condition or it can be just a change with age some of these characteristics do change as dogs get older so 
maybe they've passed examinations frequently in the past, but as they age and change very slightly, they may actually be picked up um, as, as not being quite so good by some examiners later in their life. I think probably also worth saying that we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about how we brief judges for crafts this year. And if any of the participants in the webinar this evening, if you are judging any of the category three breeds at crafts, you will have received or you'll be about to receive the briefing notes on that and really try to uh, emphasize the importance of your role actually in helping safeguard not just the health of dogs, but also the, the, the reputation of the kennel club and of dog shows as well. You know, it's really, really important that you work with us to make sure that there isn't huge reputational damage. We know what happens on social media. We know what happens to get the in, gets into the main mainstream press. And it really is not very helpful for our future if we don't all look for the right things when we're judging and make the right decisions when we're judging. So if you are if you are a judge at Crufts this year, there is a revised briefing and there will be a face-to-face -face briefing that will be carried out by the Kennel Club team. And there'll be an opportunity for the Category 3 breed judges to meet with one or more of the vets who will be carrying out the vet check process. So you can have a really clear conversation ask any questions and be really confident that the vets want to work with you. They're not working against you. Nobody wants to see these dogs fail, but there is a significant reputational risk for the kennel club and the show world if we don't get this right. And just to add, to add to that, as one of the vets who do the checks, you know, I have n none of the vets I know who do the checks like failing dogs. We all absolutely hate failing dogs. We would so much rather have a dog that we can pass with a clear conscience than a dog that we have to fail. We're not trying to catch you out at all. Um, and anything we can do to, again, as I said before, increase the transparency around this process so that you know why we're look, what we're looking for and understand why a dog might be fail, might be going to fail, I think can only be helpful in, in um, relationships going forwards. Thanks, Alison. Mike um, Hertage, Professor Mike Hertage, uh, as another veterinary observer who's wandered around Crufts looking at dogs, do you have a perspective to share with people this evening? I, I think it, the, the only perspective I, I would say is that, um, you know, to have um, somebody assess a quality assurance or quality control of what you're doing in whatever field, whether it's judging or whether it's vetting or or as I do, looking at the hips and, and, and elbows of, of animals, you know, if you've got somebody looking over your shoulder, then you try to make sure that you make the same decision each time for valued reasons. And, and you know, when they get to a borderline, you, you often uh, realise that the person that's looking over your shoulder has something to contribute and you shouldn't feel threatened by that. You know, we have to do that all the time. You know, in universities, when we're examining, we have external examiners that overlook us and uh, make sure that we try and keep an, a level playing field for uh, all people going through the examination or whatever it is. Thanks, Mike. Meg, Meg Purnell Carpenter, you judge at the highest level. You've done briefings for judges at Crufts. Uh, any insights that you'd like to share with the audience this evening? Not sure whether you're on mute, Meg. No, I don't think we've got any audio. Try again, Meg. <laughs> Try again, Meg. No, I don't think your audio is working. Sorry, Meg, we'll have to pass on you. S <laughs> sm smile at us and wave and we'll know that you're you're there and hearing us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Charlotte, back to you. OK, lovely. We have had a few hands um, up just to say, unfortunately, if you're participating, you're not going to be able to um, ask your question unless you type it into the Q&A. There is a Q&A box at the very top. 
Um, you should be able to type your question there and any that we can't answer, we will come to later. So swiftly moving on, we had a lot of questions around how we collect data from judges um, and feed that back to breed clubs, but also a little bit about how we're going to review that process. Um, we don't want it to just be a tick box exercise. So I wondered whether, um, Ian, you wanted to just give an overview of kind of how we want to collect data for judges and feed that back to breed clubs more moving forward. Uh, thank you. I thought you might direct that to me as a data geek or <laughs> data nerd on the webinar this evening. Uh, I think many of us on the committee have been somewhat frustrated at the quality of the data that we've been getting and we recognise that it doesn't really answer all the questions that we really need to get some insights. So it is a process that we absolutely would welcome ideas from the breed community and the breed club community. Um, not all judges have been submitting forms and at the moment the staff don't have the uh, time or resource to be chasing those. So we do please remind you that if it's a category two or a category three, it is a requirement that you send those form to us. They are online, they're very easy to submit. The, the content of that data collection system will almost certainly be changing. Um, and it's also pretty clear from some of the forms that we get back that some judges do take it pretty much just as a tick box exercise to get the, the form out of the way at the end. So we do uh, we do want to work to, towards a process where actually it's giving some real valid data and we are encouraging and creating a climate where judges want to flag up if they have true points of concern for any of the breeds that they're, they're judging. So we will be looking at how we go about collecting data. I think we're more likely to be much more focused on maybe specific issues across particular breeds rather than looking for more generic feedback which perhaps we've had in the past and if you take you know individual breeds most of the breeds that are on uh, either category or two two or category three most of the judges and most of the owners would probably say actually there is one key issue or maybe a couple of key issues that we really ought to be focusing on so we need to find a way of gathering data about those real priorities uh, Important that the judges do submit uh, reports, shows are under external scrutiny. The more evidence that we can get from you as judges, the better we are able to defend our position and demonstrate that we are making progress and that show ring is a, a, a showcase for healthy dogs. That's all I wanted to say, really. It's a work in progress uh, and we really would value people's input on how we might go about collecting that. We recognise that judges are under pressure uh, during a judging appointment and probably the last thing you want to do is be filling in a form, but we do need the data. Thanks. Charlotte. OK, we've we've had a comment um, from from one of the people involved this evening just to say um, that posting or publishing of positive critiques, if there's anything that we can do to encourage this with judges to better publicise and promote healthy examples, um, and particularly for smaller breeds um, or as they described, endangered native breeds, um, this would be really helpful. So anything the Kennel Club could do to encourage um, judges to publish or promote the positive critiques. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Ian. Um, As I don't judge very much, I'm probably going to bounce that to somebody like Hector, who probably does and then and spends a lot more time writing critiques than I do. Mm, critiques. <laughs> um, <laughs> do people want to see what you actually think? Well, well, they don't want to see what I write. I'm not a good critique writer. Um, uh, the, the the clues in the word really isn't it that critiques started off and it's always amusing if you're at the kennel club right library to look at some critiques from 50 80 years ago because they really were critiques and you wonder how people had the uh, had the gall to actually put them in print but um we tend critiques to me tend to be entirely positive and very much people avoiding being critical of dogs so i i'm not sure that in the present climate of critique writing that we're going to um, get too much feedback from that about hypertype and exaggerated breed features which are usually features that are valued for their type uh, in a breed um, I think the role of the 
the judge um, in reporting back is better served probably by giving us back what we use as data for monitoring breeds. And I would encourage them to include comments on on hypertype and exaggeration of type, because whilst we all like the features that we value in our breed, go back to the first uh, uh, paragraph above all the breed standards, that if something is valued, it should only be there in the right measure. We don't want long heads or long whatever getting longer and longer and longer. It's not a competition to breed the lowest, longest dachshund, I'll take your breed, for example, it's not a competition to breed the the, the dog with the longest foreface in a breed where the foreface is supposed to be longer than the rest of the skull. And so there's creeping hypertype in so many breeds. And I think there'll be value if, if judges rather could always comment on that in the in an introduction to their critiques, but maybe they should be feeding that back to us. Um, through the breed watch system, because um, that is, after all, what we're doing in trying to prevent it in the brachycephalics, where we've just gone too far. And if we all look around the show rings, we'll see that there are many breeds where there's too much of this and too much of that. I'm not going to get granular in that, but we all know which features it is that are just getting uh, far too exaggerated. And uh, we need to come back to, as Charlotte was saying earlier, they need to be a dog first and a breed second. That would be my my feet take on that. Thanks, Hector. I think the preamble to people's individual dog critique is the place to make those sorts of comments. And I know certainly when I'm writing critiques, I, I, I try and talk about whether there is exaggeration or whether there are points of concern. I've certainly written about temperament issues in the preamble to some of the critiques I've written. So there is an opportunity to do that. Maybe that's something that we should be scanning as a committee if, um, if there are critiques that we think it, there are breeds that maybe we should be looking at those sorts of things. It's another interesting source of information. And you know, judges often don't hold back in those introductory preambles. So maybe that is an interesting source of um, anecdotal or more subjective data. Perfect. We've had um, another very related point come in, actually, and I think more of a comment for consideration. But um, Leslie has said, bear in mind that there is already good evidence that conformational issues can over time so easily creep into a breed. What might be the level of focus for category one breed judges for encouraging the submission of paperwork back at the back of the judging book? So are we going to consider how we could more effectively motivate judges to provide category one reports from the back of those judging books? Well, the simple answer to that is yes, because the more data we have about the more breeds, the better. Uh, one of the challenges is, uh, you get me on my human behaviour change hobby horse for this one, how do we persuade judges to change their behaviour? And how do we persuade judges to realise that this isn't a policing activity. This is about helping all of us do the right thing for dogs and do the right thing for the show world. Brilliant. Alison, want to comment? I know you're you're also into sort of history and human behaviour change stuff. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the hobby horse I often ride is that you don't change people's minds by shouting at them. Um, and it's astonishing what change can be wrought and has been wrought in the past by breed communities when they're really motivated and on board with one aspect or another of the health of their breed. And that's the key thing, I think, to have everybody realising that we should all be on the same side, um, trying to um, enjoy lives with dogs who have comfortable bodies to live in. It, it really is that simple on one level. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so I think we have time for one last question. We did receive um, quite a number of questions that we've tried to group together really trying to understand as we move forward, will the vet check process change? Will it potentially increase to include other breeds? Would there be an entry criteria for shows? Um, and, and what's really being considered or what are we able to say at this stage about the changes that could come in um, with the new system? 
I think we want to be really open and transparent tonight. Everything's on the table as far as Breedwatch is concerned. There is so much scrutiny on the show world. Uh, there is so much more to be done. Um, looking at criteria for vet checks, looking at process, those are all on the table. We've got regular working group meetings that are looking at those sorts of issues. We've discussed health checks as a criterion for entry to shows at the moment. Our view is that that could be really difficult from a, a logistics perspective, uh, but it is certainly something that's been looked at by the group. And we're also talking about whether there are breeds that maybe are on category two that previously were on category three and whether we've done enough to ensure that they've actually uh, stepped up to the mark and maintained the level of improvement that they claimed that allowed them to be moved from category three to category two. And similarly, there may well be breeds on category two that need to be moved or category one. We need the evidence and we need the data to do that. So everything's in scope in terms of improving the quality of the system. Thank you, Ian. That's really helpful. Um, just a couple of notes um, to round off the session. Um, obviously, um, from our perspective, to thank the members of the subgroup for being here. I think that it actually adds a lot that we're able to have this community and this discussion and that people get the opportunity to ask questions. The Kennel Club will continue to try and offer sessions like this. Um, please do fill out the feedback form because we want to evolve and improve this format and your feedback feedback on how it would best work is really, really important to us. Um, in addition to that, we had quite a lot of questions that were breed specific. Um, if it's relating to Breedwatch, please do speak to your breed health coordinator. We have invited breed health coordinators to the two breed engagement sessions. We do really want to see all of the category two and three breeds there. Um, so please do take those questions to your breed health coordinator who will direct them. If there's anything outside that you weren't able to ask this evening, you can always email health at the kennel club org uk and even if your query is not specifically one that we can answer we had one just about breed appreciation days and kind of the format and zoom um we can direct it to the appropriate department and we are happy to do that and uh, i just wanted to say thank you on behalf of myself and the team and ian i'll leave you to say any final remarks before we go Thank you very much. We all know about the importance of education, education of breeders, education of judges, breed appreciation days. There's lots and lots of those going on. Uh, we talked about the introductory paragraph to the breed standard at the start of the webinar this evening. Please, please, please make sure if you're speaking at a breed appreciation day that breed watch is part of that presentation. It's a crucially important piece of the breed standard and people coming up through the judging process need to be aware of it from day one. I'd really like to finish by saying thank you to all my colleagues on the subcommittee. Really appreciate you taking the time out this evening and again even more so to the Kennel Club staff who work huge amounts of hours and effort to put these things together. Uh, these things appear to happen seamlessly but there's an awful lot that goes on in the background. So thank you very much. And a final thank you to everybody who's joined us this evening. If you do have questions, please email them, health at thekennelclub.org.uk, and we'll do our best to direct them to the right person to make sure that those get answered. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.